Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you are more to the East, or I don't know, but it's a pleasure to have all you all here. And uh, I made this presentation quite some time ago uh, because uh, once someone said that uh, it was possible to type Erlang. And uh, for some time I have uh, researched, uh, I mean, not researched as in academically researching, but researching as an individual does, like looking on Google, uh, looking at Stack Overflow and things like this, how I could improve my Elixir code, uh, both its documentation and uh, its uh, tests and guarantees. So this is why I got a bit interested on that thing about types. I hope you like this session. Uh, I start now sharing my slides with you. Here we are. Great. So we're going to talk about types, starting with what is a type system? Because a lot of people here uh, might have heard about types and have even a whole uh, idea of what it is, but it's good to have a clear conception of this for us to start talking about session types and what we have done already on Elixir and Erlang. In any case, let's start with oops, here. What is a type system? It's the first question one have to ask before we can talk about uh, type systems per se. Uh, to start, we have to consider this. You have your code, you probably uh, program it on, on some language if you are here. Uh, most likely you have a touch the Elixir or language, or language at some time. And you have your functions, you expect arguments, you have variables. But what if, they are not the thing you are expecting. What do you mean with this? Uh, when we are summing numbers, we expect numbers. What if I receive a letter, for example? Well, a type system is basically a way for you to set something like a contract. As you see here, I used the analogy of a jigsaw puzzle uh, where you have the fittings of the piece. The fittings here, on a, if we were to make an analogy with a function on, on a programming language, would be uh, both the expectation that uh, open uh, part here are what your function expects to receive, what are the arguments and what they should be. For example, if you want to sign in an user, a new user to your system, you expect them to have an email, so you expect to receive a string which is an email. But what if someone sent you something that has nothing to do with it, like a number, like a map, I don't know, then it would not fit. This is about it, about how you could put together all those pieces and the they fit. And the other part here is the return. Return is what your function returns. So, for example, when you have any function in Elixir, you might be able to see on the Elixir documentation or on the help on the uh, IX, which is the help for Elixir, that it has a signature which says this function receives an argument which is a string and returns another string, for example. So we can fit those things together. Uh, a type system is about this totally. It's about uh, ensuring that all pieces fit together. On this image that you are seeing on your screen, I have a, a drawing, actually, I edited an existing drawing of uh, two jigsaw puzzle pieces where there is no way they could fit together because uh, it's uh, a different kind of fitting, as you can see. Uh, there's the green part, which is different from the blue part. So if this was a function as we were using analogies, the piece to the left would be something that returns, I don't know, a string, for example, string dot case is a function in Elixir where you receive a string and return the same string, but upcase it, right? 
let's say that it's the left uh, uh, piece. And the right piece is something that expects something that has nothing to do with strings. For example, summing a number. It's a sum function and it's expecting a number, so there is no way this could ever work. A static type system is just about this, about checking if the expectations are being met between uh, the fittings of your uh, programming functions. If uh, what one function is receiving and using the and using the binding for is the same thing that it should be. Otherwise, it will cause unexpected bugs, right? So, as you can see on this image, which I made right now, about this analogy, this would be a perfect program, a program where all functions fit together and you are using them correct. So, the type system will check, I don't know if you can see my mouse uh, pointer here, but it will check that each part fits together. And because they are all fitting together, because they, they are all fitting together, there is just no problem here. It should work. This does not mean that your program is absolutely perfect. No, it might have uh, uh, some, uh, some business problems. Right? For example, uh, a static type, type analyzer uh, proves that your functions are connected correctly, which means that your, your program will not have something like an undefined function or any problem like this of calling a wrong function. But it does not mean that your program is doing what you want it to be. So logic uh, problems cannot be solved by static uh, type analyzers. But again, they provide one extra guarantee and uh, a lot less of manual tests to be done. It tests if you, your functions are being called correct and if you are using them correctly. Okay, now that we have this somewhat clear, let's go to the next step, talking about how we failed to, uh, to type Erlang. Uh, to do a very quick recap, a type system is about ensuring that things fit where they should. In Erlang, we tried uh, to do this, to type it at some time, but not when the language was first conceived. Why not? Because to start, Everything has a deadline, as you might know. And uh, on the case of uh, uh, Erlang, the group that was on the Ericsson lab developing Erlang, it is said by Joe Armstrong, one of those that were directly involved at creating Erlang, that uh, they did not know how to make a type system and they needed something that just worked, something that uh, met their requirements. So, yeah, Erlang was born because we needed, I mean, uh, it was a good idea for Ericsson at the moment to have Erlang, but it did not have a type system because uh, it was not strictly needed and uh, they were not exactly sure how to make it. And if that's not enough, type systems are not really great to use. Uh, a good chunk of you that are watching this presentation might have worked with Java. So when you think of type system, you might be thinking at uh, Java and the way you have to work with it where you explicitly uh, say what the the type is that you are expecting, you have to have those things explicitly said, you don't have uh, easier ways to describe uh, several possibilities, etc. It's a bad developer experience. And because of this, a lot of people uh, might have had some experience with type system, but a very bad experience. And for this reason, they do not like it. So you, 
if you are not the person who had this experience with Java, you might know someone that programmed Java. And based on that, when they hear typesys, they say, oh no, I hate that thing. And that's why typing things is hard, one of the reasons of them, because it's a relatively young field. Computation is a young field at all, and type systems are inside of it, uh, or application of the mathematical uh, of the mathematical theory of types for to it uh, has not been very friendly to use. So this is another reason why we think, yeah, I'm not sure if I want. So in '97, uh, Philip Vodler along with Simon Marlowe. I, I don't remember if Simon was all the time, but it doesn't matter. Uh, Philip was going to take a sabbatical, a one year sabbatical, and the, he called Armstrong and said, you know, I like it, your Erlang thing, I read your PhD document, but uh, ain't it missing a type system? And Joe said, yes, it's missing a type system. So Badler said, great, I'll play around and make a type system for Erlang. After one year, he actually made it, but um, it uh, did not work great, especially when you consider uh, the Erlang processes, which is the reason we are having this talk. You can't just, um, easily type check a process and the, the message passing between it, uh, between processes, because as it is done in Erlang, a process is just a temporary execution of some function on which state you are not exactly sure. And it might send messages to anyone and they might have anything on their mailbox and their state might be anything. So, it, that type system that Vader made was very limited. And not only that, it just break everything that uh, was made before in Ireland because a lot of changes would be needed to make it work. And uh, it was just not great because it was not something that you could easily do. So we failed the first time at making a type system for Erlang. And here I put a small, very small list of things that you can, um, of uh, things that make typing a system very hard. When you learned about Erlang or Elixir, you might have heard about this mythical beast called hot code swap. The thing where you can change the code that's running at the server while it's still running live on server without any downtime. It's amazing, right? Well, it's very hard to type something like this because if uh, uh, you are changing the code that is running currently, you have to have an idea on what's the current state of the whole system and what it will become and how that thing's done. So it's just like hell. I would say it's virtually impossible to make a type system that properly works with hot code uh, swap, unless you were to make a lot and a lot and a lot of manual work to describe how to handle all those situations of uh, state change. Along with it, we have the PID in Erlang. A PID is a kind of uh, uh, primitive from Erlang that identifies a process that might or might not be alive at a given uh, node. So when you receive a PID in Erlang or Elixir, what does it mean? Nothing. It just says, take a look at the, this process. It might be there or it might not. It might be anything. I'm not sure. It's just a process that might have existed at some point in time. So. If you have this kind of uh, data structure, which says there might be a process somewhere, but I know nothing of it, it's hard to type it. Continuing, message. 
I mentioned it before. If you are sending message from one process to another, it's hard to know what's the current state. It's hard to know what will happen. It's hard to know if the other process will be able to process that message. And actors are not like magical entities that just exist. No, they are just isolated functions that are being run by the scheduler in an intelligent way that isolates it. So you can't just say, hey, this is a proper state machine and whatever. No, it's just a function. So you have to analyze the function to see what it will uh, cause as a side effect and uh, what it will return and whatever. And the late hot code swap. Hot code swap. You don't really want to do hot code swap. Anyway, after some time, we tried again. Actually, you tried several times, but uh, we tried again. We uh, actually, on the Uppsala University, if I'm not mistaken, a group decided to take this task of uh, typing Erlang and said, okay, let's do it in a way that's just completely backwards compatible and uh, that handles uh, the limitations that we currently have. What they did was just an optional gradual type system. What does this mean? Let's start. Optional, it means that you can just compile and use your code without uh, having to ever run the type system. You only run it when you want. So you are not required to pass uh, uh, the type system static analyzer for your codes to, to be su successfully compiled. Gradual means that you do not have to type everything. You can say, hey, this part of the code here, I don't even try to guess what it does. Don't check. I don't know what I'm doing and neither do you. So just accept that it's most likely working. So because of this, uh, the, this new type system that was made for Erlang would just fit anywhere because you don't have to use it. And if you use it, you do not have to uh, apply it on your whole code base. You can start small and grow big with time. Not only that, unusual type system, as I mentioned before on the other slides, is about proving that your code is correct, that the things fit together, that they are working together, uh, that you are using the right thing. I mean, you are using the right function on the right place. Uh, this concept that the, the researchers at the Uppsala University uh, conceived, call it success typing, is about the exact opposite. Instead of proving that your code is right, this type system only has one objective, proving that your code is wrong. And it starts with one simple premise. If I cannot prove that your code is wrong, I assume it's right. So consider this, with all that, it means all code that already exists in Erlang, they will keep working. And you can start to type check things uh, on demand, small things, you can start them small and grow big. And uh, it will not stop your current pipeline. Uh, if uh, the, this type system does not know how to check uh, the current state of uh, an actor and its message passing because it's not something really easily doable at all. It won't do it. So it just works on the things that it promises it should work, right? So uh, to make it a bit more clear, a common, a simple type, uh, uh, a simple type system that you would have on some language like Haskell would try to ensure that 100% of your code base is correct according to what it considers correct. But this one, as it cannot check your processes, 
and things like this. And uh, it does not want to stop your pipeline. It will just try to find out things that it knows that are wrong. So it's a great improvement from nothing to something. It's still not what we want. It's still not the perfect tech system that proves our program is correct. But at least it can find some books. So here I made a small excerpt of code to show more or less how it does that check. Uh, it's not 100% uh, correct, but it's good enough for you to understand how it looks like. Here we have a small chapter of code. It's hater, 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 dot C hating, uh, and receives as parameters a, a map with uh, the key name and the key hate. Basically, this would be a program that shows, I don't know, hates of uh, places in your city. So we want to check this function, call it C hating inside the model hater. Hater, hater. English is hard still for me. Anyway, it checks the model and goes for the function. Okay, we have a function called C hating as you are using. It expects one argument, which is called params. And it might return anything because you don't know uh, yet what's returned. And that argument, call it params, might be anything because we have not yet checked what it is. Great. Let's see. The first thing that's happening is a case map fetch on params. So map fetch expects a map to be the first argument. So for this, to work the params uh, parameter should receive a map. If it receives anything that's not a map, it will fail. So if it were to receive something that's not a map, I would just say that's just wrong. Great. Then on that case, it has two possibilities. Uh, the, the second is not appearing correctly, but it's not a problem. The first is map fetch returns okay height, which is one of the possibilities from the map, uh, map fetch function. We don't know what that variable is, so we consider it as can be anything. Also, do you remember I mentioned the gradual type systems? Uh, a gradual type system is one where you can say, that uh, a certain variable, a certain value, a certain whatever can be any. So if it's any, it can be anything, I cannot check it. So we always start from the set of everything, any, and then we cut off to describe what exactly we want. Let's continue. The first part in this, inside this code block is binding a variable called the premium which is being done, done by calling the function map get inside of the parents attribute. As we know, parents has to be a map and here it expects a map, so, so far so good. Premium can be anything because we are not 100% certain that it has a certain limit. Okay, so next step, we have a case here, case premium, is true or false, there's no third option. So this means that for your code to succeed, this variable called premium has to be either true or false. So we put it a Boolean. Then we, we uh, calculate rate plus two. Do you remember we had here the variable height? As we are summing it to something else, the sum function, expects numbers. So for hate to success, it has to be a number. Great. We have here improved the hate, which is the result of this that we are checking. And it can be any of those two results, which we know that mean returns a number and that hate is a number. So improved hate has to be a number. And then uh, lastly, what we do is 
we pick up the n as n it, I don't know how to say that in English, but uh, the first, second, or third, or whatever element of the tuple call it improved height. I mean, the the uh, from the tuple height description, we pick up the first, second, or third improved height. So let's say this was one. We would pick the first element, which is alpha. So improved height has to be an integer for this work because uh, you cannot access uh, the first slash one third of uh, an element. You have to pick the first, second, or third element, whatever. So what does this mean? This means that from so far we can prove that improved height has to be an integer. For it to be an integer, height has to be an integer. For it to be an integer, if maps has, if parents wishes a map has that, it has to have that value as an integer. And lately, as it's speaking, uh, the result as one element of this tuple, which is a tuple only composed of uh, strings. And uh, as it returns, uh, a string on the other case, this function necessarily has to return a string. So with this, what, with only this information without you doing anything, the type analyzer checked your code and found out all this information. So let's say you were to pass something which was not a map here, or even on this case, a height which is a float, it will fail. It will say that it will fail. I just have to make a small uh, notice here. Technically, uh, dialyzer might not be able to pick this one because there are some things that I am checking here that uh, uh, dialyzer is not able to infer completely. But let's assume it did. This is how it works. And because it's checking here that C hating is receiving a map because C hating expects a parent and the parent has to be a map. Great, name, I don't care about that, but there is this hate. Hate will be fetched here, so we expect it to be an integer and this is a float, something is wrong. Then when you hand dialyze it, it will find that there is this discrepancy and because this discrepancy exists, that dialyzer points out, hey, you have code that is not good. I can prove that it's wrong. I have 100% uh, certainty that's wrong because of this. And it will provide you with a very good error message to describe the problem so you can find it. Like that, it will say as you can hear here. Uh, on the file that was mentioned before, something is wrong, fix it, please. Good luck trying to learn how to read the dialyzer error messages, but they exist. So that's the important part. It might be able to find some books, not all of them. It cannot prove your code is working, but it can prove on some specific circumstance that your code is wrong. So it's already a good, a great improvement compared to before, right? Except that now we want something bigger. We want something better. We have, uh, uh, I mean, the academy has uh, come to start to develop a concept based on mathematics, which are the session types, which is a type system based on how the communication uh, timeline works. So what it do, tries to do is try to uh, establish, prove, define a line of events for your uh, entities. Why? Do you remember the thing I mentioned before about actors? You cannot type one actor 
with uh, a common Hindley Milner type system because it might be anything at any time. So we don't know what state it is. We don't know what uh, uh, functions it might uh, uh, be processing. So we don't know what it will receive on the uh, mailbox and if it's cap capable of uh, handling those messages. But here, with uh, session types, we have the concept of a typed protocol, which you define as a set of possible states and how they uh, move from one state to another. So, for example, here we have, uh, uh, this is a common example that you find on any book or paper or article that talks about session types, which is the type that defines um, an interface to um, e-commerce. So it's a type called shop here, which you are saying we are saying it has both the uh, I don't know which word to use to this, I don't remember, but it has both the possible states of going to add something and the check out when you try to get to that uh, state, as you can see here, for example, and when you try to get to that uh, part of the protocol, it will ask a uh, book from you and will move you back to shop, which uh, as you can see is a recursive type. But when you are to try a checkout, it will ask for your card, your address and close the protocol. So this is really simple, but if you were to add more uh, protocol clauses, more different states, you could guess that this shop is currently on that certain state because you are describing here what possible states it go and um, the, type, uh, the static type analyzer will try to make a timeline of the possible uh, state changes based on the re uh, request you receive that it will be. So to finish this presentation, there is one bad thing that I have to bring with you, to you. Even true, session types are great. They will just solve our problem. And they already existing things like uh, ACA from Scala. They are not directly compatible with Erlang. Why? We use an actor message model, as I mentioned it before. So you have several anonymous actors. What this means? Uh, it means that uh, you can start a dozen of processes to do something. Each of those processes has a unique identity. So they are very separated things. While the protocol tries to talk about one sort of thing using that name. And uh, not only that, as I mentioned, the, uh, those actors are just temporary processes that is, they are just executing a certain function and uh, you have to uniquely identify them. So you have to consider the state of each individual uh, actor at that moment. And again, as I mentioned here with a joke with uh, the scrolling GR cat, a process in your lang, you are not really sure if they are alive or not. You have to check it because a process identifier, it just say, uh, if there is a process, it's on that place. So you still have to check. So you have to pass this information to the, the process identifier yet for it to be something valid. And le last but not least, hot code swap. Just to finish this talk, I'll tell you a secret to everyone that uh, is uh, learning your language, Elixir and interested in it. Hot code swap is a lie. <laughs> Nobody does it because it's really hard. It brings a lot of problems. Uh, the only company I knew that did this was 
Klarna. They are the one, only ones that I know that successfully keep doing hot cold swaps. Other than that, I personally never saw anyone that really kept doing it because it's too much of a trouble. Especially now that you have uh, external tools that can hand, uh, that can uh, improve your your ability to handle traffic. In any case, session types are great. They might uh, be a great thing for Erlang if we manage to get them to work with Erlang. There are research groups for this but uh, we still have no idea if it's something doable for Erlang. You can play around with those on languages like Scala with the ACA framework. I think that the Pony language also has support to it and etc. Thank you everyone for watching this presentation and I hope that it might have been insightful for you all. And uh, well, thank you everyone. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, we had one question coming in during the, the presentation from Carsten. I don't know if Carsten wants to unmute his microphone. I think you touched upon uh, his question, but I'm not quite sure. So if Carsten wants to, to ask his question or not, you can unmute your mic. Uh, well, it was basically on on the topic of uh, why hot code reloading is uh, is an issue with a type system, where natively he he would expect that writing code the type checks uh, locally, which I then swap into the system. Okay, um, yeah. this is a very good question. Uh, the question can be wholly translated to why. We can't have type systems with hot code swap. Well, we technically could, but think like this. You have three different Erlang servers, right? They are made the way that we have them. They can be totally different versions of your software. So you have node A, node B, and node C. Node A may be on a version, while node C is on another totally different version. So for you to properly type check this, <laughs> you would have to technically uh, be able to type check on your, on your code, all possible permutations of those variations because the state might be a thing on node A and another thing on node C and the way that they transition that state might be a problem. So in some, it's not that uh, hot code swap is directly incompatible with type system. Uh, I believe, and I may, be, I may be wrong, that you can type check with hot code swap, but you would have to in, uh, prove some way that your transition from the previous version to the new version will work. What does this mean? This means that you have to prove that everything that was a state of the data before can be converted to a valid new state of the data. Every function that was running before can go to a new uh, version of that function and nothing will break and nothing will uh, give problems. So you can see that this is like um, uh, a complexity that increases uh, Wow, I forgot a lot of words. Social distancing is not doing great for me, but the complexity increases so much, so much that is, it's basically um, not doable. You would not want to do this because you have to uh, prove to your system that anything will just work out fine. And uh, that's not doable. 